one, two, three. This is Penn Woods. This is September 1970. I'm interviewing in the office of Mr. John Mayo and John John D. John D. Mayo in the Mayo Building in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, Mr. Mayo came to Tulsa in 1903, and we will be talking about the early days of Tulsa. Mr. Mayo, to begin, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about where you were born and who your parents were. I was born November the 15th, 1881, on my father's farm in north, north central Missouri, Randolph County, and our post office was Clifton Hill, Missouri, a small town four miles away. Your parents? Uh, my father, you want, you want my father's... Uh, my, my father, John, John A. Mayo, and my mother, Emma Birch Mayo, lived uh, on that farm until my mother passed away in 1909. Uh, after that time, uh, he moved to the small town I mentioned above, and uh, became a resident of that little place. So, uh, uh, Mr. Mayo, uh, you what? Uh, you came to Oklahoma in 1903. What caused you to come to Oklahoma? <coughs> uh, I, like all farm boys during those days, were very anxious to get off of the farm, where we might have a better opportunity for income as we grew older and uh, became responsible for our own living. So my, my brother and I, Mr. C.A. Mayo, who was at that time living in Dallas, Texas, uh, connected with a Mer a, a real estate and banking firm, uh, Murphy Bolands Incorporated. Uh, he, like myself, through correspondence from one to the other, were continually figuring out some place we might get together and uh, open up a business that we might choose for the for our future growth in the in, in the business of making a living at the, at that uh, in 1902 1900 and early parts of 1903 I was working part-time in a little general store in Clifton Hill um, and in that store, they carried uh, furniture to a cer certain extent, and I was assigned that part of the work for which I got a touch of the furniture business as being a possible future business for growth in uh, a newly developed country such as we might locate in some place or other away from our part of the, of the country. While that was uh, happening to my life, my brother was uh, living, was, happened to be living with a young man who was uh, working for a furniture store in Dallas. And he visited with him a great deal uh, at times and uh, got an idea that uh, maybe the furniture business, and as much as I was already spending some time, it might be the thing for us to get into. We, uh, my brother at that time, uh, met 
some traveling men from the south part of the state down around Ada that uh, were in Dallas and uh, in visiting about the uh, new location for young fellows like ourselves, said, why don't you go to Oklahoma? Well, that sounded interesting to my brother, and uh, uh, we, of course, began to talk about that until uh, later on. He came up to the, the some little, some small town around Davis, Oklahoma, uh, to visit them for a weekend, and uh, they talked him into uh, coming up to Tulsa because it is on the Arkansas River and it was a prospective town for future growth uh, as everything seemed to be working its way into the state and further west, not uh, in as much as a, as a uh, two states, the, two, the Indian Territory was a part, uh, was a part of the territory in which Tulsa was in. Uh, he, he decided that uh, if we would come, might come there and uh, see what would, could be done. Well, we visited over by mail for a few months over that, and on August the 1st, 1903, he came up to Tulsa from Dallas and rented a small a small store, 25-foot store, about 100 feet deep, from a native here, Mr. Steele, and uh, we uh, decided to uh, that that might be a good place to start in. So I agreed to that, and on the first day of October, 1903, that same year. I came down here and met him, and uh, from that date on, we uh, mustered up a little money here and there and got into the furniture business, mostly on time, by uh, a wholesale firm, Chase Furniture Company in Dallas, that uh, took an interest in our desires and sold us what, what furniture we might need for six months at a time. And uh, you might say he, they, they financed us for the first year on that basis, uh, buying, buying this, the needs that we thought we had for this uh, part of the country. You know, I'm going too far away. Uh, I might ask, where is that location? Is that the same as your current store? The location of that little store has now been uh, uh, demolished, and it's between it's. It was the second. It is on the second 50 feet west side of Main Street, between second and third, coming south. That uh, we had this small store, and uh, further than that all i can say is we went to work we didn't know much about the furniture business only through hearsay and took our chances on the growth of tulsa based on the assumption that the natives here the small board chamber of commerce men and so on said that they had we we're going to have some gas and oil discoveries uh, in this part of the country. Well, shortly after that, there was a small um, a pool of oil discovered over in West Tulsa, shallow, shallow wells. And in the meanwhile, they, they, it was a, a larger oil company, the name of Guffey and Gailey, who were, came out here from Pennsylvania, and they were very active in northern Oklahoma, Osage Nation, principally, and all of that part of the of the, uh, the territory, and became the big producers of uh, uh, at that time of all the natural gas that uh, 
we had heard of up to that time. Soon after that, we did get, they did get gas, and we had gas in Tulsa. Uh, after about the third year, we were in business here, somewhere around 1905. We had natural gas piped into Tulsa, and uh, from that time on, we uh, uh, learned that uh, the possibilities were greater than uh, uh, they had expected. So uh, about all I know about it from that time on, the discovery of oil and gas reached from the Osage Nation and West Tulsa, and then the, later on, in the, uh, uh, sometime around 1906 or seven, a man by the name Galbraith discovered a well, which was a real oil well, down in the Glen Pool section, which is southwest of here, about five or six miles. So that was the beginning of the oil business and the gas business for Tulsa, and from that time on, of course, we began to grow slowly but surely on what the future had to offer. As a result of so those various discoveries, uh, quite a few early day oil people from Pennsylvania came out here and uh, lived in Tulsa and begun to explore the possibilities of the industry. Uh, furthermore, at that time, the Frisco Railroad had just recently begun, uh, finished or completed its entrance to uh, Oklahoma City. Prior to the earlier days, it, uh, the, the Frisco only came to Sepulpa. So that's about all I can say that would be uh, of interest with the beginning of the uh, growth of Tulsa and our growth with it in the furniture business. Naturally, uh, we would uh, uh, enjoy the uh, visits from the newcomers as they would come come in slowly but surely from year to year and our furniture business became quite a uh, little business for us to such extent that in we had grown from the little store that uh, in 1905 we rented a 50 by 100 and 30-foot building across the street known as the Sheldon Building and moved our little furniture store into that. Thinking of the uh, early furniture store, you're, uh, could you describe some of the early uh, the, the furniture that you were selling, the types of furniture you were selling when you first came here? Well, <laughs> at that time we were selling uh, for household use principally uh, uh, iron bed made by a firm that was furnished by this uh, jobbing uh, interest, Chase Furniture Company in, from Dallas, known as the T.B. Laycock Company of Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, we got all of our beds for sleeping purposes there. And then as far as the bedding was concerned, we uh, uh, had... Uh, nothing but we never had anything to offer above a common ordinary mattress with a cotton top and the excelsior filled body that was our that was a kind of a bed that we my mattress that we sold and our the laycock people also sold furnished us our springs coil springs what uh, the old-fashioned coil spring that you Put the, you set up to be iron, the small iron bed and put the, the coil spring on next with bed slats in it, under it, and then put on this cheap mattress. And they, they were made naturally out of Excelsior with a thin cotton top for comfort, only on one side, though. It wasn't reversible. And I know we sold them around $3.50 a half piece. The, mattresses and we sold the beds all the way from 
three to ten dollars was about the tops for our beds. Springs also cost about three dollars a spring, so that was a bed. As far as the furniture was concerned, our bed, a better uh, furniture for the bedroom was what was called a, a folding bed, a, well, a, a bed built out of uh, plain oak furniture with a mirror in the front and cased inside was one of these uh, cheap type beds that I'm telling you about, mattress and spring. And so that was let out at night for people to sleep in, that, that which they used in their guest bedroom, you might say, or their parlor. And they slept on that. And then in the morning, they made it up and turned it back, set it back up. So that was the bedroom. The chairs were very plain chairs, and uh, most of the most of the furniture that we bought from this firm, uh, the only place we had any contact with or credit, came from the High Point, North Carolina, and from there we got bought uh, 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 be uh, dining room furniture, uh, sideboards. Uh, side tables, dining table, and chairs to go with it. That was our that was our furnishings for for the dining room. And uh, you know, I might say that that entire equipment wouldn't run more than fifty dollars. All of it, chairs, tables, and for, and uh, uh, other pieces of furniture that went in the room. Uh, on that floor, we bought. Uh, we uh, all uh, were able to make a contact with some uh, 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 people who were uh, handling, uh, uh, same as the Laycock people. They were agents for some uh, uh, what's called uh, Axminster rugs, cheap ass Axminster rugs. Well, we bought a lot of those rugs for the dining rooms and for the living rooms and for the bedrooms. And a 9 by 12 rug, and it was a very good grade. Uh, we sold for $12 and a half to $15 a rug. Incidentally, I might say that uh, I ha have had, but I've lost uh, track of them right now, which uh, I'm talking about 65 years ago now, uh, tell, uh, come in and tell me uh, occasionally that they still have that 9 by 12 rug or two that they bought from me, and they think it's just as bright and pretty as it ever was, and they wouldn't give it up for anything, uh, along with the furniture, the sideboards and the table, still using them. So that's the way the uh, whole thing worked out for us, furniture-wise, uh, in that department. In the living room, we had uh, a very comfortable uh, Davenport, such as it was, and it made into a bed. We uh, It folded up as a full-length Davenport, and then it opened up into a full-size bed at night. And they used that in the living room to sleep on, along with the other pieces of furniture, such as uh, chairs and little tables of one type or another, all all cheap furniture, and all of it coming from this uh, same uh, manufacturing group over in the high part of North Carolina, was our outlet for our furnishing of a home of that kind. As to the kitchens, we never handled anything in the stove or range fashion. And we stayed out of that because we didn't have money enough to get into it. And the uh, kitchen range stoves at that time naturally had to burn wood. So we stayed out of that. And that's about the way we carried on for several years. And uh, we grew with the growth of the community and the development of uh, uh, the surroundings till we got uh, dealing with other people like the Abernathy Furniture Company in Kansas City, who were another big jobbers that carried us from month to month for year in and year out, and along with William Volker, 
another great out great company up there that handled linoleums of all kinds, window shades, and uh, uh, curtains of one type or another, for so that uh, we could furnish a home uh, in a pretty good way. And uh, uh, that's about all I, I I can't think of anything else that was more primitive than that beginning. But we made we made money on it. We worked hard. We worked seven days a week and till midnight and lots of nights setting up that uh, cheap furniture and getting it ready for sale and as a result of that and watching uh, the ends and watching the growth of the town and visiting with all the newcomers and making friends we we were both very young men i was 20 about 22 years old would have been 22 years old after i landed here and my brother was about 25. So we were had lots of friends. Everybody was friendly. Everyone uh, we had lots of visitors and lots of loafers that would come in. Young men. The town was filling up with young prospective attorneys and young doctors, and uh, they were all our friends. And they'd come in and trade with us. And then we got our business got to a point where we. Uh, 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 sold on an installment plan and, and to, to increase our volume. Well, we had, uh, used, had to use a truck, a, what you might call a, a, a truck, uh, with horses to deliver this furniture. So finally, uh, as we grew, the country had grown ahead of us, and we were on our way to greater things. So we uh, operated in this 50-foot store across the street in the same block, only across the street, until 1909. During the, excuse me. Uh, during the period, uh, say from 1903 to about 1910, who were some of the personalities, some of the leaders uh, uh, in Tulsa during this early growth period? Well, uh, that's uh, the merchants are the, 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 the various ty uh, t types of merch merchandisers at that time was a firm called uh, William, William, Williamson Brothers. Uh, uh, they were next door to us. We had uh, this little 25-foot store and another uh, young man from the south came here and open up he was a druggist he had a little he had the other 25 feet then next what was uh, his name? uh i don't I, ca I can't remember his name right now I, but anyway he was a young man and uh, active like we were and he finally sold out and left but williams brothers uh, uh bill uh, george and bill williams uh, uh were the uh General, little general store on the corner. They had a 50 feet uh, Williams, W I W L I M, and so on. Uh, they were on the corner, and then uh, shortly thereafter, the uh, First National Bank moved from down between First and Second Street, and a small store, that was a small bank, that was opened up prior to that time, several years by Mr. J. Forsyth, an early day uh, cattleman and rancher that uh, saw the need of a bank here and they, they operated that bank until it changed hands and grew as we did and other people, other firms grew and, uh, and, and I, I don't remember the date now of, of the beginning of the old First National Bank which was a five-story building on the corner right across the street of Second Street on the north, on the southeast corner there, right there where it is. And I don't know what's there. I believe that's torn away now. Now, as to far as uh, uh, grocery people, the call there's a firm with the name of Trees Brothers that are operated a, a grocery store right across the street from us. 
Then there was another firm called a Bean Vanver Company, which was W.A. Vanver of uh, the Vanvers of this day now. Uh, Opa had a store on the east side of, of uh, Main Street between 1st and 2nd. Now you understand at that time there were no sidewalks, only board sidewalks laid in front of each building as a uh, elevation provided for them. So when you got off the uh, uh, passenger train down at the Frisco and went, walked up to uh, the corner of 4th and Main, you, it's like going up stair steps. You'd go 50 feet or 25 feet and you'd go up a step. Then you'd go another 25 feet and up another step. And most of those boards were loose too. And incidentally, while, while I'm speaking of the sidewalk, feature of the fronts of all these stores. Uh, the weather had we had no uh, had no pavement of any kind. The main street had hollowed out out in between the east side from the west side to a very deep depth. So two or three feet deep it was had worked its way out. All horse driven traffic uh, of course handled that and so that was about the view and about the conditions of Tulsa at that time. Just uh, so let's stop a minute and I'll show you a picture. Uh, Mr. Mayo, I just saw the picture you showed me of the Goodwill trip that you made in 1907, a, gr a group 1908. Uh, I wonder if you can tell us about it, where you went and what the purpose was. Well, the purpose of this trip was uh, motivated by the enthusiasm that uh, our Chamber of Commerce built up among uh, certain uh, uh, members of the Chamber, merchants like our, myself and many others. And so we finally uh, uh, made a contract with the Frisco Railroad to uh, furnish us a train that would carry 120 people or more, and uh, we uh, also, our, the Secretary of our Chamber of Commerce had made all arrangements with the various cities we were to visit on this uh, journey, which was an 18-day eight day trip, telling the people in those eastern cities what we had to offer down here in Oklahoma in the way of a new way of life and the greatness of the oil and gas business that was that we were confronted with. It was no way, no way to tell just how big it was going to be at that time, which has been proven, of course. But uh, our stops were out of this. Uh, in uh, in Missouri, we stopped at Springfield and were entertained by the Chamber of Commerce there for an hour or two, and in uh, St. Louis, and then all to Louisville, Kentucky, and then to Cincinnati, Ohio, and then to Toledo, Ohio, and then we went on to uh, Philadelphia, and from Philadelphia we went to New York, and from New York we went to Washington, D.C., from Washington, D.C., we went to uh, Detroit and uh, on around to Chicago and finally made our last stop at Kansas City at the end of our journey and had a great time and were treated marvelously well by all of the uh, business people of the cities in which we visited. The uh, only thing I can say about this uh, that might be of interest is uh, one would say, well, what did you do it for? Well, we had uh, we had some, uh, not many, but we had some people that uh, responded to what we uh, had in our little traveling show 
enough uh, interest in this southwest country that uh, within a month's time there was been a, there was somewhere between 25 and 50 people had moved here as a matter of fact uh, to, to bear that out uh, I have had a, made a very good friend and became a very important man here in Tulsa in his way uh, beat us home and with his family, came here but came came back came to Tulsa ahead of us on our trip that uh, uh, the, as a result of the selling, we gave him from our con from our speeches and talks that he heard in the town in which he's living in, and that was in, in a, that was in a uh, a uh, in a, uh, um, a town I can't think of now. That she's in Ohio, not Toledo. We stopped at sort of some little town in in. Uh, in o Ohio. Did this man remain here? Long Did I died right here. Good man. man named Goodman. Who? Man named Goodman. Goodman. Yeah. Uh -huh. Dan, a fine man. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, that. It was a booster trip, and we, uh, of course, had just become a state, and we thought we were grown up, but we had a long ways to go, of course, and the only way we could gain would be by going out and inviting people to to come down our way and see what we had to offer. And uh, that was just a stepping stone to the many, many uh, uh, moves our Chamber of Commerce and other groups, civic clubs and so on, have made for the past 50 years towards the growth of Tulsa. They've all been imbibed with much enthusiasm and uh, uh, towards the cause and have spread their, spread their uh, uh, feelings about the welfare and the, the greatness of this country to every friend that they could and uh, let that multiply that by the number of years that that type of boosting has been going on. You can see how Tulsa has grown from a town of 1,600 people when I came here in 1903 to what the last report gives, 325,000 in the town proper. I presume that was the first Goodwill trip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, were Goodwill trips a new thing across the nation at that time? I, I never heard of one before. Mm -hmm. uh, today it's an annual event of the Tulsa oh, Chamber, isn't it? Yeah, well, not, no, not necessarily. Some of these civic clubs make trips. Yes. Some of them do. It's a grand thing. Here's the idea. It's just, it's just, here's how valuable it is. I live out here in a, a, a block, and you live over in C block, and I don't try to get acquainted with you, or you get acquainted with me. Uh, first thing you know, and treat everybody else in those uh, blocks the same way. If we have some sort of growing problems out there, if you don't make friends out of those people, how are you going to get it? Or how are you going to get the job done? So united we stand, and divided we, of course, stay apart, fall. That's that's about the best way I can tell you. And our Chamber of Commerce got sold on that idea that the only way to do is to go out here and sell what the oil people told us we had in the way of oil and gas possibilities in this state. And uh, we knew that not only would something better than that come or is good later on, but we knew that it would bring a lot of people here that uh, really would like to uh, move away from the settled country in which they were in and get out into the wide open west. And uh, uh, that brings up a thought right now. We haven't very many spots left to to uh, move into from uh, for a relief from congestion and from tiresomeness of uh, of uh, your surroundings and the retirement age of people that would like to get away. There's no new places for them to go and enjoy quietness and growth and freedom and interest in everybody. Everybody being interested in the other man's problems. So where do we go? I can't think of a place unless it's New Mexico is a pretty fair spot. 
And I, I can't think of another place in the United States will take for it to, to convince uh, one of the, that thought. Look how look at the people that are uh, trying to locate now in Alaska, in that terrible climatic country of Alaska, because it's a new frontier. So we are we've run out of frontiers, and uh, Oklahoma is. Uh, Oklahoma can take care of another two or three million people more than it has here now, and everybody live and be prosperous and enjoy life and be a master of what they own if they want to come here. And not only that, industry is looking for the same kind of a country for their business, and as a result of it, if we uh, handle our problems as we should, uh, such as the... Uh, development of this Arkansas Basin program, uh, bringing uh, industry to, to Oklahoma. We ought to gain another million people here in the next 10 or 15 years through industrial growth alone. And everybody have a home of his own and never had a home before in his life that's working for these, uh, these, um, uh, these uh, industries. Of course, Oklahoma's got a big job ahead of it to take to make that interest. They, they've got to build up their schools, their churches, and their way of life, and their roads, and everything of the kind to make it make it desirable because these big companies don't just move for fun. They move to make make a success of their program and to give the people that they employ, whether they be local or bring some of them with them, so that they are happy. An unhappy group of people, whether it be the Ford Motor Company or the General Motors, if they're all unhappy, they're, you're in a bad way. So now that goes to, that's about the way I see the, the, the possibilities of Oklahoma for a greater state in which to live in. We've got more water in this state by reasons of a series of dams that the government has built here than any state in the Union, including the Great Lakes country. This country has got more more sport area, more fishing ground, more hunting ground, and more uh, more uh, wheat. We've got for, 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 for produce, we've got wheat, we've got cattle, besides the oil, and many other things too numerous to mention, along with the, the that, the, uh, that recreational side that I mentioned here for weekends for people to go and they can go in the day and night and be gone and never never miss the time from where they live take their families and what else can you have have they got it in Missouri no have they got it in Nebraska no have they got it in Kansas no and name them and, and, and uh, just name the states that haven't got what we've got in Oklahoma for, for recreational uh, uh, enjoyment. Just name it. Uh, the, uh, let's go back. Uh, Mr. Mayo, I'd like to for you to discuss a little bit about the physical growth of uh, Tulsa, particularly. We might think of downtown Tulsa, including the streets as they were paved and uh, grew up. Uh, the major buildings as they began to go up, the larger buildings, uh, including your own buildings as well as the other buildings, the banks and so forth, the Civic Center, the Pacific Center, and uh, as well as the as well as the current Civic Center, just kind of recall as you can. The year is not as important as just basically uh, uh, what happened as these things began to grow up. Well. Uh the first street that was ever paved uh, in Tulsa was uh, was First Street, paved from, uh, uh, I would say, uh, Denver to the Midland Valley, what is now the Midland Valley tracks. And it was paved, believe it or not, by brick, brick pavement. That was later on, of course, taken up uh, years afterwards and put out with a the regular pavement. Uh, beginning with, uh, that was in back in 1905 and 6 that they did that. 
then from that time on they start they, they, they the paving program begun to take uh, uh, action uh, I would say it started uh, around 1900 and uh, six or seven main street and then the different streets that they paved just like they do now as they can get to them and uh, that's uh, that's that's how far back uh, now the first automobile that I ever saw in town was in 1907 well I can't think of his name right now he was a lawyer Maxwell Carr first one that I ever saw here uh, Maybe I, you see that's trouble. I can't think of these that's things. Right. Well, anyway, the first building of any height was for old First National Bank building. I'm talking about five stories high. That was promoted by a group of the First National Bank, and uh, that that was the first five-story building. Then the later on, uh, the uh, R. T. Daniels, a man that was very well known here for many years came here and he built that uh, building on uh, corner third main uh, fourth and uh, main uh, next to our furniture store then he built the present Daniels building and in the meanwhile they the uh, the uh, first na the National Bank of Tulsa which was at that time the called the exchange National Bank place of National Bank of Tulsa was uh, built, I mean, the first unit of it, and then they they re re rebuilt to it to where it stands now. And uh, that was back, uh, that was as early as 1900 and uh, around 1910 that that was done. Well, uh, first one building after another, we, uh, we uh, this, this building here, the first five floors and the first 50 feet, we only had 50 feet. We built a, a five-story building here in 1910. Then we purchased it 50 feet north of us here, that where we are sitting now. That, that we were. This is the court in here. We purchased it and we built a built a twin to it, tied it together, which Was is this it. an office building then? Yeah, always all above. We had our furniture store below. We had three floors below in our furniture. Always, you know, because we never quit the furniture business. We got in the real estate business on the side, but we'd gotten up to where we were in those days pretty big boys, you know, in the furniture business. We had a lot of, we sold a lot of merchandise, and we made a lot of money, and we didn't have anyone to bother us. Every dollar we took in, we it was our dollar. Then I didn't have the government to contend with at all. We had no taxes to speak of. We made a... Uh, I well remember one year here, we did $110,000 worth of gross business down, not in here, but down on, down the street here, and cleared, I had cash clearance out of $90,000. Think that over. $110,000 volume, and we had $90,000 value. That's quite something. You see, we, we, were, we weren't giving anything away. And we weren't spending any. We were doing the work all ourselves. Had no expense. Well, then came on and uh, getting back to the building thing, uh, we had uh, the. Uh, uh, I kind of have to kick the, the the palace building. Simon Jankowski built that building early. He built that uh, two or three years after we built this building here, and then the first national bank then moved they got too big for their place and they built the building which is vacant now on the corner of fourth and the main out right here moved into that grant mccullough was the president and the head of that and then uh, i told you about the national bank of tulsa they built that first 10 or 15 stories there and then built all around it up and built a skyscraper about when was that built well, uh, the newspapers can tell you every bit of this. They got the they they all you have to use, they built it they built it in the last uh, they built it sometime between the 
1930 and 1940, I forget when. But on and on, these buildings were built uh, one after the other. They, then Wade Phillips, of course, moved here from Okmulgee. He was a big oil man, and he was in the, uh, he uh, sold his oil, uh, uh, sold his companies out for big sums of money, and then they went to, he built the Phil Tower building over here, and then he built the building across the street where the Pan American is now, and then a lot of other rooms built, uh, built that fine home out here where the uh, the uh, Phil Brook is, and gave him a quarter of a million or a million dollars to improve it, and you can go out there and see what he did. He did it all. And uh, he's one of the greatest benefactors this town ever had. Uh, there never has been a single man. I, I don't want to be quoted on that because Bill Warren's doing a great thing and Joel LaFortune's doing a great thing and all that. But I mean, back in those days, he was, a, he was the greatest benefactor we had. And uh, Jim Chapman's been a terrific man. Great Scots, the money that he was given him. But you, you're talking about building now. I don't want to be quoted on anything that's going to get uh, get anybody saying, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm, I'm just telling you. You ask me, and I'm telling you how this town was built. It was built by these different men. Well, we built this building. Then after we built this, we a few years, we raised it on up five floors, the whole thing. Then we built in 1919, we bought this ground where the petroleum building is down here, and we built that building. Then in 1922, we bought from old man Bob Bynum, who was the man I was telling you about, that 50, 150 by 140 feet down there, and built the Mayo Hotel. And we built that. We started in the, and uh, started excavating in August 1922 and opened it ready for business in February 1925. So the Mayo Hotel has been standing there since 1925. And I'm just saying this to you off the record, that's, a bi that's the best building in the state of Oklahoma. I'm just telling you that. That's the best building because I know my brother and I built it. We didn't have any contractors. We had builders. We were the, we were the bosses. If you can find a crack, it's 45 years old. That's four, over 45 years. It's about 45 years. 1925, 1970. Yeah, it's about 45 years. If you can find a crack in a ceiling or on a wall around there, I'll buy you a box of cigars. <laughs> and you show me a building that's in red for Here, it's this building here. You're sitting in a room here. It's built in 1910. Well, no, it was. It was built in uh, 1915. This ray, this top, and this this building's full full of rooms like this. Just look it around now. Then go over in these other yeah. go, over, go over in these new buildings. Look at them. They can't they can't help it. Can't, they neither have the material that we had, nor they have the workmen. They don't. They have no. They, they have. They didn't have the loyalty and the interest that we had in these people. And we were paying them five dollars a day for ten hours' work. Of course, to get this done. Now they are paying, they are paying uh, anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars a day for these employees for eight hours, and they looking out the window and telling one another funny, funny stories half the time. I suspect the uh, only comparable building in Oklahoma City would be the Concord Building. Wouldn't you? That was our number one building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the Huckins Hotel. Yeah, I know it's they had a hard time tearing it down. Yeah, it was built right. Yeah, they built them right. Back in those days, they built them right. Mm -hmm. Well, now I don't know. Is there anything else the, you want? Well, um, we, you mentioned a few of the names and the uh, thinking of the oil people and the and the others. Uh, you you named some. Are there any other leaders in Tulsa in the in, in the field of uh, business or education or? Uh, religion or any other field that you feel ought to, uh, uh, not necessarily that you feel are the most important because everybody's opinions of, you know, there'd be many differences. I'd but be people afraid. You feel are, people you feel 
uh, other people you feel have made a contribution over the years to the growth. I'd of be afraid to touch on that because it's, I, 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 I wouldn't know. Yeah. There's, there's many, many leaders here yeah. in that yes. program. Mm -hmm. well, industrially mm -hmm. speaking, uh, 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 we have the leaders among mm -hmm. the Chamber of Commerce group. Now, neither has Oklahoma City. I just talked to man over there. They say when Gaylord passes out, why well, the, the the Chamber of Commerce over there, you know, has lost the greatest leader that they ever could hope to have. Whether they agreed with him on everything or not, he fought him with the newspaper if he didn't like it, but he, he always supported it as a great man. I know him quite well. But we haven't got the, we haven't got the, uh, now this is, I'm just talking this, uh, you haven't got the men like my brother and myself were in business now coming on that paid their way, borrowed their money, paid the debts, didn't ask anybody for credit to go on their note. You haven't got that class of people today to build a town. If they want to build a building, today it's promoted. Mm -hmm. A promoter comes in here and he gets an architect and he tells them how much, uh, here's the building that you want, I think, and here's what it will cost. Mm -hmm. The government is backing it up now and the insurance companies, he takes these figures to them and says, and he borrows 100% mm -hmm. or more on the estimate. Mm -hmm. And had, a lot of these deals are never going to work out. You had mentioned uh, that in the uh, early period that uh, seeing a horse or was a horse or mule, I don't remember which, that was uh, up to his rump and butt. A horse to these, these. Can you describe, we'll put this on now, uh, can you describe uh, that situation about when it was and what happened? Well, uh, Main Street was, uh, uh, as I had said before, was... Uh, had uh, washed out to where it is almost a, uh, a dry stream. It is so deep uh, as against the sidewalks on each side uh, of the uh, street from the Frisco tracks all the way up to Fifth, up to Fourth Street, which is the south end of town, you might say at that time. So in order to uh, build it up, and getting ready for a, a paving contract, someone uh, took a contract and filled uh, all that street with dirt, good rich dirt. It took a lot of it, filled it from off of those two blocks, or three blocks almost, up to the top. And uh, in some places there, that, that fill was as much as five feet deep to level it off, make it a level with the, with the building's service, you know. During heavy rainstorms, the cab drivers had the horrors of their life to get around. And one, we had one very long, rainy spring, I recall, and there was no sight at all to see horses drawing these cabs in mud up to their bellies and unable to move any further and had to be gotten uh, the harness taken off of them and taken them loose from the from the cab and uh, uh, get a rope and somebody help on the outside to pull that horse out with with a team of horses on the side take you put a rope around his belly and uh, around him and the team pull pull him out of that mud hole, it wasn't more than 10 feet wide, but nevertheless, it, is a, it had to be done. That's all we could get them out. That didn't happen too often, but it happened once. Shortly after that great fill I'm talking about was made to level Main Street up, we had that rainy sea, rainy spring, and there was, that was the result of it. What would you say in Tulsa during, over the years, thinking particularly back in the early years, where the uh, most uh, um, 
either outstanding or maybe traumatic events. In other words, a major fire or a major uh, um, uh, uh, storm or something like that. that well, the biggest effect. fire that we ever had in Tulsa, the most damaging fire we ever had in Tulsa, was right here, the mail building. All this top, all this all burned up. We had to tear the concrete down, all down to the floor. Burned up all this block here. Uh, we caught over here in Kelmer's decorating store. He had a paint painter painter over the uh, C D Kelmer paint shop. And he had his basement filled with barrels of oil. And the next to it, that's this whole block now almost down to where the to where the corner is. And the next to it, that the building belonged to Mr. C. P. Alexander, the man that owns this building across the street over here. That time he was alive and here. That uh, that it caught, and when they when the fire it caught somewhere in the, in this uh, paint shop, about six o'clock in the afternoon. No one around here at all. And the, this top of this building was in in in, in the casings, you know, where the cement poured there it had lumber all around it. You know. So when that uh, when that fire caught got into that basement, the blaze went a hundred feet above the top of this building. When was that? In 1900 and, uh, 1916 or 17. Burned all night. Fought, fought it all, fought from, from uh, around 7 o'clock in the evening and they discovered it until they're still fighting it at noon. Uh, got it out about daylight the next morning. I went, my brother and I went down in the basement of this building here where we had furniture down there. We had a big, big basement down there. And uh, to look around and uh, see the furniture like this desk sitting here. And then, so we were wading in our water right up mm -hmm. to here, up to our hips. That, that's, how yeah, much, so that, that's how much water had been poured oh. on and run into there. Any, uh, any storms that were of particular note? No, we've never, I, I don't know of any great disaster we've ever had here, one of uh, much uh, that has caused very much prob many problems to the uh, to the community, I don't know a thing, that's, well, that's outstandingly bad. What about events, newsworthy events that happened in Tulsa that you feel, uh, uh, particularly those you may have either witnessed or been a part of or, or have first-hand knowledge of? Well, uh, I don't know. I guess uh, as far as we want to get materialistic like I am, I think the greatest event we ever had here uh, from a growing angle, was the day we celebrated the the, the had the, the turned the uh, water into Tulsa from Spavano. What was the uh, what, when was that? Do you recall? 1925. 1925. Can you uh, can you describe the uh, was there a celebration or? Yes, we had it a short. Uh, uh -huh. some peop speak pe people come here from uh, the east and made some talks uh, from St. Louis and so on. Just dedic just to dedicate it. Uh, uh, it was to to us. We were we had no water. This Arkansas River water was not fit to use. You know, people were buying bottled water and we we're growing and growing and buying bottled water. And you couldn't take a tub. You couldn't take a bath in a tub. If you got out of it, there'd be a uh, enough sand in the bottom of the tub to uh, fill that drawer and so on. So the Mail Hotel never had a gallon of anything except spavin all water into it. We built it that way. We stayed, we, we, we moved, we were slow. We, we built our hotel, started in 22 and opened it in 25. We didn't move any faster than the water, than the water line moved from Spavanaugh. So when we opened this hotel, we opened with Spavanaugh water. So it was naturally a great event for not only because there was a personal feeling about it, but because for me, but because of the fact 
it did so much good to so many people. Yeah. Now, uh, as far as other incidents are, are concerned, I I would know uh, we've had a lot of uh, we've had a lot of uh, little things here, just like Oklahoma City. I would know what to say that was of uh, unusual importance. Uh, it is. A, it's pretty hard to yeah. say. Uh, I don't know what you're driving at. Well, uh, I think what, what I'm driving at is what you're telling me, which is great. Uh, can you uh, tell about the opening? Did you have an opening ceremony for the Mayo Hotel? Oh, sure. Tell about it. Well, it, we just had a grand opening. We threw the, threw when the, we, we threw the entire building open so the people could march through from top to bottom and uh, from top floors all the way up and down and look it over. And... Uh, we had no other celebration than that, only just a welcome to the public to come and see what we had to offer. And so uh, we were owed a lot of money when we opened the doors, and we were anxious to get busy more than anything else. You take these big companies, you know, now they have some, they'll, they'll spend uh, $50,000 saying grace over something that, uh, that uh, it's big. Uh, we're spending the the stockholders' money. We weren't spending. We spending them. We were spending our own money, and we we got to we got we gave everybody a warm welcome and everything the kind, and then we got busy and said we were in here for business. Had to. Had to. So we owed a million and a half dollars. We had to work it out. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayo. Uh, we have just uh, concluded an interview with Mr. John D. Mayo of Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is September 1970, and we're in Mr. Mayo's office in the Mayo Building. Thank you a lot.